The planet of Tal Volantis is one that should have served as a warning to humans that approached the area. But humans being humans figured out what had happened and why it had happened much too late to save our home planet of Earth and really our own skin. The species there had essentially set up its own extinction in an effort to impede the progress of the nigh unstoppable brother and moons and their consuming of all sentient creatures in the galaxy. While it worked for a while, this was only a temporary solution that led to the decimation of an entire race of intelligent beings. Who were the Tal Volantians and what became of them? Glad you asked. Let's jump into their lore and morphology and learn about their history and anatomy, and then subsequent necromorph changes to their physiology. So let's kick this thing off by asking, who were the Tal Volantians and why should we care? The natives of Tal Volantis were a species that may have actually been more intelligent than humanity or at minimum more resourceful. They reside on the water planet of Tal Volantis roughly 2 million years ago when humanity was still running around the savanna of Africa and with more hair as Australopithecus. So essentially, we weren't even homo sapiens at this point when the Volantians were struggling with their own species mortality. Prior to their demise, they were fish-like arthropods based upon their anatomy. Gills, collapsible fins, and large bodies, all their evolutionary traits point to the fact that the planet wasn't always a frozen wasteland, but we will get to that momentarily. The Volantians vary greatly in size, and it seems that they appear to be creatures of indeterminate growth. We actually see this in our own oceans, and it's called deep sea gigantism. And judging by the fact that the Tau Volantians appear to also walk on the surface of the sea floor, this lends credence to the hypothesis as they would quite literally be in the deep sea of their planet. Anyhow, on this planet, which basically seemed to be a global ocean, these aliens began to number in what was presumed to be the trillions. As their numbers grew, so would their desire for energy. It would appear that much like on Earth, their planet was seeded with a marker as well. After their discovery of the marker that appeared to have unlimited power, the Tau Volantians trailblazed the exact same path humanity would millions of years later. They began to cover the planet with these markers, which in turn spread the influence of the marker further and further. Then they had their first necromorph outbreak. Due to their size and presumably immense strength, many of the natives would have been quickly converted. The ranges of size mean that the largest would have absolutely decimated the smaller Tau Volantians, as seen with the alien hive mind, which appears to me to have been one large alien. This quickly would have created biomass for the convergence event. Then as quickly as it began, convergence wasn't far behind. As bodies were flung up through the ocean and a Brethren Moon began to form, this would spell the end for the Tau Volantians. But rather than at the hands of the Brethren Moon, it was by their own design. Again, these creatures were quite resourceful, quickly building a terraforming machine. They flash froze their own planet in an effort to stop the Convergence event. While successful, this would end their species, or at least their homeworld. It's possible that they had some sort of space program, but no evidence has been located to suggest that this is actually the case. Seeing how advanced they were though, it would be strange for them to have a terraforming machine without knowledge of other worlds. So we have covered a very basic portion of the Tau Volantians and what they look like. Let's go a little more in depth so that the changes or really lack thereof make sense. Adult Tau Volantians at their smallest appear to be in a range of 8 to 10 feet tall. This is roughly 2.4 to 3 meters tall. This wouldn't be all that strange of a height for a creature in the ocean. However, on land, humans are not in really that wide of a range. Our skeletons must contend with gravity of the planet, leading to humans who typically fall within a standard deviation of about 5 foot to 6 foot 6 inches, with outliers being more sparse. This again is due to the limitations of our skeletons, muscle, and bodily systems to support much more than that. Sure, there are larger animals, but typically they are quadrupedal as opposed to bipedal like us. Tal Volantians appear to have been quadrupedal when they chose to move. However, their posture was more upright than a lot of quadrupedals on Earth, meaning that they would have had a lot of the same physical characteristics as humans as well, sort of like a skull that sits on a spine rather than is held up by a spine. But this is also due to the water supporting them as it lessened the effects of gravity because of the water's literal physical support. This in turn raised the standard deviation from their smallest height of about 8 to 10 feet all the way up to well over 100 feet tall, which is roughly about 30 meters in height. This would quite clearly mean that their weight was different than our own as well. They could afford to be heavier as they physically did not have to support themselves, which would yield creatures weighing several hundred pounds to several thousand pounds, which conversion actually works out the same way in kilograms as well. Their bodies appear to be segmented somewhat with plates of exoskeleton, but what is most interesting is the fact that they have six appendages and live in the ocean. It is known on Earth using the fossil record that arthropods were really really the first, more complex animal. Prior, it was just about all jellyfish. However, during the Eocene period, this highly successful species appeared to be hit by quite a few events, like climate change, which would ultimately lead to their downfall, and why a lot of them ended up going 
extinct. However, on Tal Volantis, it appears they followed a similar evolutionary path to Earth, and the creatures started out in the ocean, and as life continued on, this yielded arthropods. They, however, did not experience that extinction event, so this gave them time to advance. And as they did, it appears that, in turn, this yielded the Tal Volantians, which went on to dominate the planet's surface under the ocean. The structure of a Tal Volantian cannot be seen too well due to the necromorph aberrations and induced changes, but in the larger Tal Volantians, it is seen quite clearly, and also, these structures can be assumed to be on the smaller ones as well. So, we all know it, we all love it, back to the feet we go. That's not gonna age well. The Tal Volantian's foot is nothing like a structure of a human foot. Instead, it appears like a singular spike structure that folds backwards. As you can probably assume, this wouldn't be the most stable structure, but what is interesting about it is that it is spiked on the back. This would more than likely allow the creature to stab into the ground and fight against strong currents should any arise. The leg arcs in a structure that we actually really don't have a name for, surprising I know, but we can assume that the quadricep of this creature connects to an area that would mimic our own pelvises. This connection point is actually on the sides though. So think of it this way, if your leg were on backwards and instead of connecting to the base of your pelvis they connected to the sides, this is what the legs of the Tal Volantians look like. Interestingly, the pelvis appears to have a secondary sternum just above it. This is more than likely where a lot of the internal organs are, but this sternum serves as a purpose beyond just protection. The secondary arms are located around where human obliques would have been, which is just above the primary sternum, almost towards the base of the top ribcage. This secondary sternum more than likely provides attachment points for the muscle, aiding in its use and function of these secondary arms. This would require a secondary set of pectoral muscles around where the abdominal muscles would be, and this is allowing the creature use of its arms. Now these arms can serve a multitude of purposes from hanging on to prey, or even quite possibly, they could just be a leftover trait from the arthropod days. It is not known exactly what they do, but what fun would that be if I didn't speculate? Judging by their location, lacking of grasping ability, and having a more pincer-like ability, it seems that these would have been for holding on to things under the water, but are much less functional than the main arms. So perhaps they truly are a leftover trait from an earlier day when they were used for crawling on the ground. It should also be noted though that there is quite a wide variation of these arms in the species. Whether they be a subspecies or simply genetic lottery, some seem to possess more pointed appendages, while some actually have arms and usable secondary arms with large fingers. Although it can just be an age thing and as they age, the arms become more usable. Anyhow, in these specific Tal Volantians, these arms could be used to stabilize their bodies while the upper arms are used more for their original purposes. Also side note, less functional does not mean useless however, sort of like your appendix. It's functionally vestigial, but it still does perform some duties in your body. The main arms of the Volantians are used in some capacity for walking, but also as you and I would use our arms. Again, some larger Tal Volantians have been seen with the lower arms existing in presumably a support role, whereas the smaller Tal Volantians appear to use their upper arms in this support role. Once more though, these arms can be used to hold tools and create structures quite clearly as they built a society. But now as necromorphs, they appear to really only be used in quadrupedal locomotion. The chest of a Tal Volantian possesses the primary sternum once again, almost creating a line down the front of its body. The benefit of having these two sternums would be innumerable with fighting necromorphs as they could protect the internal organs. Moving further up, we come to the head. The head almost looks like a headdress worn by humans during ceremonies actually, with six bony protrusions coming out of the sides of the head and a large flat plate where the forehead would be. This creature is kind of oddly shaped. In the skull, it appears that there are many nasal passages allowing them to produce vibrations in water to communicate. But interestingly, as indicated by Dr. Serrano's notes, this is not their actual language. To communicate with any other species that might happen upon the Tal Volantians post-extinction, they created a pseudo-language utilizing their nasal passages to create sound. These sounds can be translated much easier and as such makes the warning more clear. Their original language is unknown, but considering that they did have to turn to a pseudo-language, maybe potentially they had some sort of psionic ability to communicate with one another. But that's pure speculation, and is not indicated anywhere in the game. It also is possible that since they lived in water, they could have created a much more complex system of noises using compressional waves like we do when we talk. These waves would vibrate in the water and in turn be interpreted by others. So just like our throats make sound, perhaps they had a similar form of communication, but again, utilize the 
nasal passages in the skull to create another language as a warning. So with that quick rundown of their anatomy, we come to the alien necromorph. Even at their small size, these necromorphs did not require too much change from the body of the Tau Volantians. Again, because of their deep sea gigantism, one body would be enough biomass for a necromorph to be an absolute death machine. And this is what we see with the alien necromorph. These creatures are as large as a brute and essentially replace the brute variant. There appears to be some heavy alterations to the exoskeleton, however. Much like that of the snow beast from the earlier episode, these protrusions appear quite pronounced, mainly existing around the shoulders and lower arms, as well as back of the alien necromorph. But of course, starting with the feet again, we see some changes in this area from the original foot. The foot has been extended forward and no longer curls up underneath the body. It can now be assumed that it might be used as a weapon for piercing, and under it exists a bone that creates a flat surface for walking. This new bone is also extremely sharp and pointed on the back, meaning that both front and back of the foot area are sharp and capable of stabbing. The structure of the leg consequently has changed, creating a more 90 degree angle. This in turn has caused the body to lean forward more. The legs now appear to be connected to the back of the pelvis rather than the sides. This allows for some spikes to form on the front of the legs where they connect with the pelvis. The abdomen of this creature has cracked through the secondary sternum exposing the pelvis and the creature's internal organs as well, or really what's left of them. It would appear that in some ways the secondary arms have moved up on the body and towards the bottom of the top sternum. This secondary arm also is now curled up rather than to the side, which almost seems to direct anything that it grabs towards the face of the creature. This area also hosts another form of attack. It seems that the species more than likely reproduce by laying eggs, and this particular variant of Necromorph was actually female. The alien is able to fire out what appears to be infants, which, like any other human counterparts, explode on contact. They don't seem to run out, which again, suggests that there could be thousands of eggs in there waiting to be unleashed upon unsuspecting victims. The top arms appeared to be mainly there to really help with walking now. Due to the changes in the legs, the alien now leans more forward like a gorilla of Earth, and as such, needs arms to support it. These arms sport a few bony growths, which can be used for smashing and stabbing. They remain somewhat in their normal structure, which is peculiar seeing as the marker usually changes the host quite a bit, but then again, that might just be for tiny humans. The fingers have increased in size, giving it a better footing for walking and more force behind each hit. The shoulders and trapezius appear to have increased in size and armoring. This is mainly due to the fact that it has a charge attack. This would give the shoulders the ability to hit with great force and perhaps even crack the exoskeletons of non-infected, leading to the decompression of them internal injuries, and which in turn could lead to their death. The head, to me, appears much more skull-like. While the dead Tau Valentian sported a more sloping area of the head, this can be a presumed to be connected tissue in between the bones. This is missing in the Necromorph version, leading to a face that appears to be all bone. This isn't really too far-fetched, considering that humans completely lose all of their face meat and it falls off when we become infected. The nasal passages of a Necromorph do still make noises, however. Much like that of Necromorph humans, Necromorph aliens appear to scream as they advance on you. This high-pitched whistling appears to be air flowing through all these passages, which could actually be a form of attack underwater. Ultrasonic frequencies underwater could damage parts of hearing of the non-infected and disorientate them. However, with the water gone, it seems this ability is largely stunted, leading to just a noise that warns you more than anything. There is no specific death animation for this particular necromorph. They're just exceedingly powerful, it seems. Able to pick up a full-grown man and throw him as if he weighed nothing. But then again, I suppose to these creatures, humans essentially do weigh nothing. When hitting Isaac, he really just falls apart. The amount of force exerted on him should blow him backwards, but instead, as stated, it just really blows him apart. So, anyways, thank you guys for watching my video on the alien necromorph. As I am a earth biologist and scientist, as far as I know, schools aren't offering a master's in xenobiology yet, so some of this is obviously speculative. But do you have an idea on how these creatures operated? I'd love to hear it down in the comments, but also, if you think I missed anything, drop me a line. So, a bit of an update, I am actually heading out of town next week. I do not believe that there will be a video coming out. Your boy has actually experienced minor burnout uh, between my full-time job and making these videos, so I believe I'll probably rest rather than work on vacation. But when I return refreshed, I am covering the liquors from Resident Evil 2 Remake, and I'm going to start up live streaming once again. So, you know, get ready for that. I will drop my Discord, Twitter, and Patreon links in the descriptions if anyone's also interested in that. And of course, I would like to thank my patrons. So we've got an absolute mad lad. Thank you for the $100 
expert donation, Joseph Givens. Uh, I'm gonna have to make a new tier for this one. Next up, at the scientist tier, we have RTM Chornage. And after that, it's not a spoon. Our residents are Oz Hickman and A. Laurentis. With their PhD in genetics, we have Allison Gasparro, Andrew Lawson, Divine Whisper, and Lappy No Skill. Next, holding it down with their masters in biology, we have Adam Hartswick, Mr. Poifish, Cough Syrup, Zervelian, The Run of Lies, Edgy McGee, Brandon Brotherton, Scott Grant, The Otter Man, and Cameron Smith. And last but not least, with their bachelor's in morphological sciences, we have Kyle McHenry, Ulfnar Head, 845719, Fruit Eater, Trixie Lula Moon, Add to the List, Molten Tarts, The Original Fat Ass, Riot, Russell McBride, Anthony Charles West, Anthony Wolf, Alex the Gun Guy, Professor Bennett's, Captain Gas Mask, Akigao Comics, Dustin Ellis, and Eric Scott Gillies. Whew. All right. Thanks, guys. So that about wraps this up. I will see everyone in about 13 days. Hopefully the channel does not crash and burn in that time. So go watch something else, you know, on this channel. Anyhow, thanks for watching, guys, and I will see y'all in the next one.